what's new on the Burlington waterfront. Hey, now it's happening at the waterfront on Lake Champlain. Whatever the weather, there's so much to do on the new waterfront, the Burlington waterfront. Good morning and welcome to On the Waterfront. My name is Melinda Moulton and I am your host. And today I have the wonderful uh, looking forward to moment for the next half hour with a dear friend of mine, Mark Redman, who is also the executive director of Spectrum Youth Center and the author of his new book called, which was just released by Onion River Press. And Mark has been making the rounds and talking to a lot of people about his book, but I really wanted to get him on my show and have him share with you basically his life and, and why he was called to the service that he's been called to. It's um, So Mark, thank you. Melinda, so great to see you. Thanks for having me back on. This is great. Absolutely. So first off, I want to start by saying that I've read the book and mm -hmm. um, this is available at Phoenix Books. I'm assuming too that they, is it on Amazon yet or? You can get it on Amazon, but uh, Jeff Bezos does not need your money. So he you doesn't. <laughs> Thank you. So go to Phoenix His next Books. Moon ride. <laughs> go to Phoenix. Well, for those people who don't want to go, but you can order it from Phoenix and they will ship it That's to right. you. That's right. That's right. And there's an Call audio Phoenix. book I did, an ebook. It's all, it's all there. It's all Shop there. local. Shop local at Phoenix Books. Yes. But why, yeah. why would I eat? Thank you for that. Got it. <laughs> uh, but I want to just say um, your style of writing, Mark, is um, this is an epic book. It's your memoir. It takes the reader through your life mm -hmm. and you end up in Burlington at Spectrum. And um, what I love about this book and I, what I love about you is the style in which you write. Thanks. It's it's snappy. It's you're a great storyteller and you move through a tremendous amount of, of time in your life in a very succinct and colorful way. Mm. And I, I had trouble putting it down. So Excellent. I just want to say that before I move into That's my wonderful. interview with you, I'm going to go wonderful. to speaker mode. So okay. since I want you to do most of the speaking. Okay. Um, so I want to ask you first off, Mark, what moved you to write this book? So interesting. I listened to a podcast with a, a Buddhist priest and uh, and Matthew Ricard is his name. And the, or the podcast interview said, why did you write this book? And he said, I wrote this book to help people. That's the only reason to write a book. So I thought, well, if someone asked me that, that's what I'm going to say. I, I wrote it to help people. But beyond that, you know, I'd been doing the storytelling. I did The Moth. I had a show on Broadway. I had a show at the Flynn. And so many times, Melinda, after I do a show, someone would turn to me and say, when do we see these stories in print? They need to be in print. So that's where I got the idea for putting them in writing. And uh, really, when the pandemic hit and everybody at Spectrum was commanded, including me, to stay home, that gave me, you know, half an hour in the morning of not commuting and half an hour in the evening. So, well, there's a spare hour. I should use that to write. So I call it my pandemic book because I really use that time to write this book and, and it took me about a year year and a half to do so so that's why i wrote it that's not that's not a long time to write a book so you obviously had this flowing in your in your being and to get it out on paper was you did it some of the stories i had written it for magazines i've had a lot of them published in different magazines and newspapers you know and then a lot of the stories i had told on stage Right. But as you know, it's, you just don't take what you said on stage and plop it onto a piece of paper, right? It's a different medium. Of course so, you know. uh, So a lot of it. So I was able to kind of get it done in a pretty quick time because I already had a lot of it written. So to my viewers who, who are just tuned in, I'm talking to Mark Redman, who's the executive director of Spectrum Youth Center, and his new memoir is called, Called. There you and go. It's I, like, who's on first? Who's on first? I'm That's on second. Right. Are you on third? Where are you? Um, so I, so I, and I really encourage our readers to to contact Phoenix Books and get a copy of this book and read Mark's new book. Okay, so a lot of this book um, uh, is steeped in your faith. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask you, how has your faith guided this calling? That's such a great question. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was born a Catholic, raised a Catholic. I still go to Catholic church. I'm very involved in my parish. And um, 
I don't know. It was, it's just such a core part of me. Another interviewer asked, he said, but you don't really push it on anybody. And I'm like, no, I don't bring it up. Uh, supposedly, uh, yesterday was the Feast of St. Francis. And supposedly he said several centuries ago to his followers, go and preach the gospel. Use words only if necessary. Meaning it's how you live your life, you know? And that to me is why my faith is important to me. To me, it is about helping the poor and feeding the hungry and sheltering the homeless and visiting the prisoner, you know? And that's how you live your faith. So to me, that's how I interpret my religion and my faith. People can interpret their religion, their faith and none in different, how they want in different ways. But for me, you know, even growing up, I can remember being in grade school and there was a, a missionary priest who would visit our school. He was from what they called Biafra then. And he was talking about, you know, the families and children he was working with. So then when I was at college, I met someone who was walking from Guatemala to raise money to help people after an earthquake there. So I think all these things accumulated to really affect me and really to lead me to pursue a very different path, as you know, than the one I was on. You know, I was a finance major. I had a job on Madison Avenue. All sure. my brothers work on Wall Street. They're all younger than me and retired because they made so much money, you know? And so this was very different. And I really think it was my faith that really led me to go in this very different direction. And you challenged your faith a little bit in the book, a little bit about where religion has gone and that your, your religion really is a calling to serve those dis who are disenfranchised. I really, it causes me a lot of pain and suffering to see, you know, how Christianity has kind of been hijacked by the, what I would consider the right wing and even the white supremacist wing. And I often look at that and think, what, what Bible are they reading? I mean, is it- or what, G, or, what G, or what Jesus are they following? Yeah, who are they following? Because- but I, but I love that you get into that in your book. Yeah, I really couldn't help but not to. I'm like, this is not the person who I'm emulating, you know? I don't know who they are, but so I hope I'm right. I think I'm right. And I think history will prove that People like me are, are correct, you know? Absolutely. Oh, you are so right. You are so right. Thank you. Um, so could you share with our viewers a bit of your struggles that you encountered along the way on this journey that helped you arrive to where you are today? Yeah, I would say, you know, there's one chapter in there where I write pretty openly. I went through a very serious depression, you know, after I got divorced. And uh, th that was really crushing and very, very surprising and kind of came on me very suddenly. And uh, I have a whole chapter there. And that, that chapter, Melinda, has gotten a lot of attention, especially from men, you know? There's such a stigma in our society overall about mental health, especially for men. And, and I've gotten so many emails and messages from men or people who know men who are struggling with anxiety or depression and won't deal with it. So that was, you know, I was very fortunate. I got very good help. I, I went for professional help. I had a psychiatrist and I had a therapist and I went on medication and I came out of it. But I think that chapter alone, I think, will help people. And, you know, we owe so much now to Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles and people like that, right? Who are saying, you know, it is okay to say, I am suffering from mental illness right now and I need help. So that was certainly a struggle there. And then, you know, I read another chapter about I had a staff member get killed. I had a 19 year old boy high in crack cocaine who murdered one of my staff, who stabbed to death a 65 year old nun who was volunteering in a house we ran for homeless boys in the South Bronx. And, you know, I got the call in the middle of the night, you know, Sister Virginia's dead. And I had to go up and the house was swarming with police. It was a major story in New York. And, you know, if just something like that happens, Melinda, you really start to question, like, why am I doing this? Am I wasting my time? You know? And I really started to believe these kids can't be helped. They don't want to be helped. I should go back to Madison Avenue or do something else. I am wasting my time, you know? And then I was asked to take over a, a, a home for homeless boys in Brooklyn in a very rough section. Williamsburg today is like all prepsters, you know? And it was not like that. And in 1991, it was one of the highest murder centers in New York City. And uh, first I declined. I said, I'm not interested. You know, I, don't, I know who these kids are and they can't be helped. And the uh, guy who recruited me kept asking. So I finally said, all right, I'll give it one more try. And I uncovered massive corruption where the staff were stealing 
food from the place, supposedly selling drugs to the homeless boys in the house. And um, I decided I was going to crack down on that. And it, as you read, it was a pitched battle between me and them. And uh, I won. <laughs> I won. We got rid of those people and we created one of the best programs in New York City for homeless teenagers. So uh, that really was a turning point, but that was a struggle. I was going into work every day, Melinda, with a knot in my stomach, wondering, you know, who, who's waiting? You know, what, what, what booby trap is out there? I even at one point, as you read, the only friend I had was the cook who warned me, these guys are out to physically hurt you now. Be careful, be very, very careful. So that was a struggle too, but I, I persevered and uh, you know really turned me around and led to where I am today in Burlington. So what kept you going when these things happened? What what kept you going? You know, I think it was a couple of things. My parents, my Irish Catholic parents, raised me to be a fighter. They raised me, you know, and you know I was that way. Not physically fight, but not to give up, you know. To, to not, not to shirk, you know, if someone's challenging you, you just don't back down, you know? So they raised me to be a, a fighter. And then I think, I, I had felt like these, when you look at kids who are 18, 19, 20, a lot of these kids have been screwed over most of their lives. They've been let down by their families, frankly. They've been let down by school systems. Most of the adults have let them down, you know? And they really believe by the age of 18 or 19, you can't trust adults. And I was like, I am not going to be just the next adult who lets these, it was all male, who lets these boys down. You know, I felt a moral obligation to stay in there and hang in there and, and try and do what was right and stand by these kids. And I, and I think they respected that. I think they could see what I was going through. And I think that meant a lot to them. So I think it was a combination of both things. I was really raised to try and stay and fight for what's right. I think I still try and do that. I know you, you do that too. And we need a more people in our country doing that. And uh, so I think that was it. And just this belief that these kids really did deserve a decent place to live filled with people who cared. And that's what we achieved. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hats <laughs> off to you. To my viewers out there, I'm interviewing Mark Redman, who is the author of a new book, called called and you can get your copy at phoenix books you can call phoenix books and they'll send you a copy i really encourage everyone to read this book it's such an inspirational book now we're going to move on to a lighter subject which is the story of how you met mary beth christie and it's such a wonderful story and i know it's in the book but mary beth is right here in vermont with you and everybody knows mary beth and loves her and this is a story that when you first told me just touched my heart and so i'd love my viewers to hear this story from your from your lips yeah sure i've told it on stage at the moth and people love it and it's basically uh, so you know i was married i got married in my 20s we were married for 10 years the marriage didn't work out so uh, you know i shared custody of our son and uh, a couple of years later, five or six years later, uh, my brother called me and he had gone to his high school junior prom with Mary Beth in 1980. OK, so like 20 years has gone by. I can still remember him like leaving our house in my father's Cadillac and he had a puffy shirt and a tuxedo, you know, and he was taking Mary Beth Christie to the prom. And every couple of years, I'd say to him, hey, whatever happened to your prom date? He'd have a high school reunion and say, oh, she went to Notre Dame and oh, she's a TV reporter. So 20 years go by, Melinda, and he's on a bike ride from Boston to New York, the AIDS ride. And he's in a park in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut with 3,000 cyclists. And who is the TV reporter covering the bike ride? Mary Beth Christie. And somehow among the 3,000 people, they saw each other. And so he called me after the ride, said, you'll never met him. Guess who I met on the ride, man, I old prom date from 20 years ago. I said, oh, I remember her. I'm sure she's married and children. He goes, no, she never got married. So I was like, wow, I just started a job in Connecticut. I I'd like to meet her. So he said, well, why don't you call her up? So I'm like, I'm not going to call her up. What am I? Hey, you went to the prom with my brother 20 years ago. Do you want that? It's crazy. So anyway, he was like, well, suit yourself. So I don't know, six more months go by. I'm trying to start a charter school, which I wrote about in Connecticut. There's a big hearing and the media is there. And I saw a female reporter. 
I went up and said, hey, you ever hear of a reporter named Mary Beth Christie? She goes, yeah, we work for the same network. She's in the next booth next to me. So I took my business card and I wrote, hi, you went to the prom with my brother 20 years ago. <laughs> Thinking, right, Melinda, she's going to call me, right? No, no, that was, that was dumb, dumb. So now another six months go by and I'm reading this. It's a Catholic magazine. I've read it since I was in grade school. It's called Mary Knoll. It's about missionaries in Guatemala. It's, who's writing for this magazine? Mary Beth Christie has the byline on one of the stories. So I was like, this is crazy. This woman's name keeps popping up. So a few weeks later, uh, I, a buddy of mine, a good friend of mine was a priest. He was a medical doctor. He'd worked in Tanzania with AIDS patients. And he was a Mary Knoll priest. So I emailed him and said, hey, any chance you, you know this woman? So anyway, he said, yeah, I have her email address. So he gave me her email address. And of course, I emailed, hi, you went to the prom with my brother 20 years ago. <laughs> so we, we agreed. It was so funny. Back then, there was no Facebook. So we emailed each other back and forth, back and forth. So finally, she emailed me and said, I feel like Meg Ryan in that movie, You've Got Mail. I mean. Do you really exist? And can we please meet? <laughs> I said, well, listen, I have a son. I'm a single parent. I have a teenage son, which for a lot of women was a deal breaker. And she said, that's OK. You know, no, don't, don't worry about that. So anyway, we met and uh, we, we met on the street corner and uh, a car was coming by and we went across the street. And I, did, I don't remember doing this, but I just kind of tucked my arm under her elbow, you know, as the car was coming. And she later told me that when I did that, this thought flashed in her mind, this is it. This is the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. This is the person I'm going to marry, which is exactly what happened. We got married the next year. All right. It's such a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing ah. that with us. Oh, yeah. I love telling that story. It's beautiful. So, Mark, um, throughout your book, Your Dreams, yes. you had a profound effect on your and many on many of your decisions and where you could tell us a little bit about that, about your dreams. So it's so funny. I still pay attention. I wake up every morning. What did I dream last night? Most of the time I can't remember, but I was going for therapy and, you know, I was really desperate, Melinda. I was still very depressed. I was on medication. And at the end of one session, I turned to this guy and said, is there anything I'm doing everything you know, possible to get out of this? What else should I be doing? And as I walked out the door, he said, yeah, see if you can remember your dreams and come back and tell me what your dreams are. And so I bought a little tape recorder and some, many times I would wake up in the middle of the night, record the dream, go back to sleep, and then play it the next morning, you know? And the dreams helped me just tremendously. I, I tell people, it's like free therapy. If you don't want to pay for therapy, just try and remember your dreams because they will really give you a lot of clues as to what is going on. So to this day, I, I have, you know, binders and binders, you know, I write these dreams down. And I've actually made major decisions about my life. You know, when we were, you know, I got offered the job at Spectrum. I had a lot of misgivings, you know, about taking the job or not. I really did. And um, for a lot of reasons, and I'll never, i have never forget, I had this dream where uh, I'm driving north and I'm in a business suit and I, I'm going to New England somewhere. And there's a big banquet hall filled with people. And the mayor of Stanford, Connecticut is there and he says, I want to introduce to you this person, Mark Revin. He's coming up here to do this very difficult job and he's going to need help. And he doesn't know anyone who's going to help him. And one by one in this dream, people are, I'll help him. I'll help him. The whole, the whole audience, went, I'll help him. So I literally woke up, you know, and said to Mary Beth, I know this is a big risk. We have a newborn child. We're both going to quit our jobs. I, I think I should take this job and we should move to Vermont. So that dream really helped. And as I tell, when I meet people like you, I say, hey, I didn't know you back then. That was you, Melinda Moulton, who was in that dream. You know, that was you, Rich Tarrant, who was in that dream. That was you, Holly Miller, who was in that dream. I didn't know you, but you were the people saying to me then, I will help Mark Redman take on this very difficult task he's about to take on. And, so, how, and how blessed are we in our community that you did take the job and you did come to Burlington because you, you. you've made such an incredible difference here. And so is my wife. Look okay. at all, and you know, you know, Mary Beth's in the legislature now. She has done so much, you know, so we're so grateful that we that we took the risk and came up, you know. Yes, we are, too. Thank you for that. Um, so I loved your mantra. At least we're still in the game. At least, <laughs> hey, at least we're still in the game. 
<laughs> so explain that a little bit to my viewers. So I gave him Spectrum and the board was pretty open with me. You know, they said, we have a great program. It's a great organization. We do have some problems. You know, we have some financial problems. And, uh, you know, the police uh, hate us and the business owners on Church Street want to close us down. Uh, do you want the job? So I, I did take the job. And uh, there were a lot of great things about Spectrum. My predecessor, Wilro, was, was a great man. But, fin you know, financially, it was literally, Melinda, you know, and you probably know this because you've run businesses. It's literally, can we make payroll this week, you know? So we were, I was running around getting second mortgages, second lines of credit, you know, just we had to lay people off. I had to close things down. It was terrible. And at one point, by I remember it was before Thanksgiving, you know, we literally had no money. We literally were like, we got to pay people on Friday, you know. And I remember we had a board president, Dale Rand, uh, Randall, great person. And uh, he was on the front step and I turned to him. I was like, what are we going to do? You know? And I remember he said, at least we're still in the game. You know? So like, that was like, that was, I just get repeating to myself, at least we're still in the game. At least we're, and, and we did. And, you know, I'll never forget. It was the, like right before Thanksgiving, I went over to see our banker. It used to be called Chittenden Bank, Brian Meyer. And I went in on bended knee. I was like, I know we owe you $100,000 on the first line of credit, but you can see we're sending you weekly reports. We're making cuts. We're, you know, but I got to pay people over Thanksgiving. Will you give me another $100,000 line of credit? I expecting he'd kick me out of his office. And he said, we'll do that. So uh, I always remember I went to the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception right here. And I got down on my knees. I was like, thank you, God. Thank you for Brian Meyer. Thank you for Chitton and Bank. We're always going to bank with, with Chitton and Bank from now on. So they had it. So we worked it out. And over time, Melinda, more and more people supported us. And we paid off the second lines of credit. Then we paid off the first lines of credit. Then we paid off the second mortgages. And you know, now we have an endowment, you know, so we can actually pay people better. And, and you know, we've expanded. We have a warming shelter. We're in St. Albans now. There's so many wonderful, wonderful things that we've been able to do. But it was all because of we're at least we're still in the game, right? Still in the game. You're still in the game. Tell us a little bit about Act 74 and your efforts to get this passed in the legislature. That was so when I in, yeah. When I interviewed for the job, uh, the, there were some social workers on the interview team, and they kept saying, "We got to get these kids ready to be 18. Got to get them ready by 18." And I was like, "What's the big deal about 18?" Well, I said, in Vermont, if you're in foster care and it's your 18th birthday, you have to leave your foster home or your group home. So I was like, you know, that's crazy. In Connecticut, it's 23. In New York, it's 22. My own son is 17 at a prep school in New York City. If I said to him, hey, Aiden, on your 18th birthday, you have to leave my house and support yourself, I don't think he'd make it. So anyway, I said, I hope you hire me for this job. But even if you don't, that needs to be changed. So they did hire me. And, you know, I had a lot to do at Spectrum, but I really dove into this and uh, we passed the bill. It took four years, you know, and I always say Gay Symington was key. There were certain people who were key to this and she just got an honor too, which she deserves. So now and it's 20 around the state. Yeah. What did she get? Well, the, the women's fund, is that it? I, I believe so. But now it's now it's 22 and it also helps uh, kids with disabilities. Oh, oh yeah. It I also mean, raised I all the kids to that level that now they get yeah. services until they're 22. Yeah. So it for was, that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, Jim Douglas signed it. That It was yep. a team effort. Although yep. when I heard Douglas was going to sign it, I said he's going to sign that bill at Spectrum. because <laughs> Nobody did more than I am. I'm looking at my office. The picture of Jim Douglas signed that bill surrounded by our there kids. He is. Here's the picture of Jim. Yeah, there he is. Good. The bill. Right yeah, on, Governor. Got, got it's fabulous. Well, good for him. And yeah, it's a good for him, bill. but. It was um, safe. You, you can't be a soul warrior in any of these. You know, you have to get a team of people, you know, some kids saved, United Way, all these groups got together. That's how we pushed it over the line. So, Mark, something that I want to talk to you about um, is, is the issue of trauma in these children. Yes. Um, that's a lot of what's happening with these teens is that they were raised in an environment that creates trauma. And so talk to us a little bit about that and how you've helped these teens to, to deal with that and to move on and to have um, and to have the lives that they now have. Share that with us, would you? Yeah, I mean, you are so right, Melinda. You know, you, 
when you really get to know these kids and learn a little bit about their story, trauma is so often at the root. They were either physically abused or neglected or sexually abused. Really terrible, terrible things. So we're lucky. We're on the front page of the free press last Friday because we have a team of mental health and addiction counselors. And they are specifically trained in trauma. You know, everything we do now is trauma informed. There's certain types of therapy that they do, which are really used to help get underneath. We know that often underneath the addiction is some kind of trauma, right? So it, it's one thing to address the addiction, but unless we address the underlying trauma and what's driving this, this need for relief, um, you're not gonna get that much success. So all of our staff are trained in that and they are excellent. We're expanding, Melinda. We had maybe four mental health counselors four years ago. We're now up to 14. Uh, I'm gonna convince our board, I hope this week to buy another building because I don't know where to put our, all of our counselors. We have them spread out in different buildings. So I'm looking at a building on Pine Street, but you know, even with that, Melinda, we have 80 kids on our waiting list, you know, which is terrible. What does that mean, Mark, on your waiting list? What does it you mean? You say the parents list? call or the pediatrician calls. This is a youth suffering from uh, anxiety disorder, eating disorder. And I'm like, we'll put them on the list and we'll, so, we're trying to hire more counselors and we'll get them in as quickly as we can. And I hate to do that. I hate to do that. So how many more counselors would you need to deal with the 80? We're hoping. I just ran into a new one in our in our kitchen. I was like, hey, you're new, right? Hi, I'm Mark Redmond. We're hiring them. And of course, you can't say to a new counselor, oh, here's 35 kids. We want you to start counseling, right? You have to build them up, build them up, ramp them up. So we're hoping by having that many that we'll be able to cut into that waiting list in the next couple of weeks and months. But I think the pandemic kind of unleashed right melinda a lot of our problems that were there anyway well and poverty and homelessness and, and yeah the, oh, I mean, the homeless thing our warming shelter opens up on november 1st we're struggling to hire staff just like everybody else is right so i may be i've said i'll chip in I'll, I'll, i've done overnights i know how to do an overnight if you need to i'll, do I'll come work for you mark redmond i know you will. i'll come work you. for you absolutely I know you will. so to I my viewers will. we're talking to mark redmond whose new book is called called and you can get it at phoenix now we're coming sort of to the end of our time and i, I could talk to you for literally all day long i know um because i just adore, absolutely adore you um but i want to um Asked, I, I really want you to share with our viewers one of my favorite businesses in all of Vermont, which is your detail works. And I take my car there and get my car detailed a couple times a year. And I, and I want you to share that you have created this profit making uh, business to support yeah. the kids and teach them about business. And to so share, share that story, would you please? Sure. So we did strategic planning about four years ago. And it's easy when you plan, like just to pat yourself on the back. So we're doing a great job. We have a jobs program for 20 years where our staff place kids in jobs, city market, healthy living construction companies, and they do a great job. But about only 40% of the youth stay in those jobs for as long as 90 days, which is the federal standard. So when I met with our staff and said, why do these kids bail out of jobs so quickly? They said they don't know how to show up on time. They don't know how to speak to a boss. They don't know how to work as part of a team. It's all the soft skills. So I said, well, the few kids who are succeeding, what's in the secret sauce there? They said a boss who understands who these kids are and how to handle them. But most bosses, they're not trained in this work. They're running a restaurant or whatever. So that's when we came up with the idea, well, we are trained in how to work with these kids. Why don't we be the boss? So why don't we start a business and hire our own youth? So we put all these entrepreneurs together from Leadership Champlain, uh, all these dealer.com, all these companies. Hey, help us figure out what business to start and to do a business plan. So we landed on car detailing and we called it Detail Works. It's up on Industrial Avenue and Avenue C. And there's seven kids up there right now today, and they have their uniforms and they have their badges and they get promotions, you know. And so we've gone, we measure what percent now make it to that 90 days. And instead of 40 percent, we're at 86 percent. So we've more than doubled. And then we followed them Melinda, after they leave Detail Works, how are they doing in those jobs? So guess who's coming here three weeks from today? Uh, CBS News with Nora O'Donnell. They're coming up here. 
on October 27th to do a story on detail works and uh, to put it on the evening news and then with Gail King the next day. So well, send, that, send that out to me so I can get that up on. So that is outstanding. Well, one of the gifts that you have is to be able to get out there and put the message out. Right. And you do right. that so effectively. And your book called is going to is going to be is it helping to do that as well. But you are a great promoter. Thank and, you. And, and you're somebody who really gets out there and has no problem asking people for money. And your personality is really what has taken this organization to where it is today, and 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 your staff and and the teams that you serve. Uh, but I want to just I would just want to would you put out the phone number for people to call Detail Plus and also the website so anybody who's watching this program, if you want to get your car detailed, to call Detail Works and sign up, and you can do it all online. And you take your car in and leave it and you pick it up at the end of the day or at noon and it's beautifully done. Yeah, good. That's that information. Good. Yeah, I mean, the main website is spectrumvt.org, right? So okay. you can, it's all on there. You'll you do it on there. So you go to spectrumvt.org and there's an yeah. area there on Detail Plus. There's yep. also a phone number that you can call and set up an appointment. It's all there. It's so, so, so great. You've created a venture for this non It's wonderful. It's so great. And I go up there, you know, I kick the staff out and I bring pizza. And I say to the kids, all right, I'm the big boss. What's bad? What's good? And universally, Melinda, they're like, we love it here. You can make a mistake and you just don't get fired. You know, the staff listen to us. They coach, you know, you know they love the staff. It's really great. And, and that's they love their clients. They, I mean, I go in and there's a big smile and it's like, they're so proud of what they did. And is there anything we can do? I mean, I feel like I'm, you know, with surrounded by friends. It's and that's it's, wow, that's a wonderful way to it's, put it. It's really true. Um, so in closing, because we're coming close to the end of our show, yeah. which when we're done here, I'd like you to stay on. Sure. Uh, don't hang up on me. I'd like to <laughs> I'd like to do a, a closing with you. Um, there is there is this uh this uh saying in your book, which I'd like you to expand upon. He held nothing back. Mm, that's right. He held nothing back. I can't. Even, <laughs> what context did I say that? In? <laughs> well, it was towards the end of the book. It was towards the end of the book, and somebody said that to you. Is he held nothing back, or yeah, somebody that you yeah. that you knew said, you, you know, he held nothing back. And I think if I were to, just, I love seeing that in the book because if I were to describe you, I mm. would say he's still in the game and he held nothing back. I, I mean, love that. You well, put it funny. out there. People keep asking me, you know. How old are you? How long are you going to do this? I'm like, I'm 64. Uh, Joe Biden is 79. He's still at it. The Pope is 79. <laughs> He's still at it. Patrick Leahy is 80, <laughs> right? I mean, these people are still at it. So I still have a lot of energy. It doesn't even feel like a job to me. I wake up every day, you know, probably the way you feel about what you do. Like, I can't wait to get in. I have no desire to leave it. And you're right. There is that saying you held. Oh, right. A buddy of mine passed away. One of my right. best friends right. from college. And I gave the eulogy. And I, I said, uh, he, oh, I said he left, not, he left it all on the field. He left it all in the field, which is a sports expression, meaning when you're out there in any sport, he and I played rugby together. He gave his all. He never dogged it. Every bit of energy and effort he had, he spent on the field. And he not only did that on the rugby field, he did that in life. And I, I said that, you know, when I go, uh, I hope somebody says that about me. You know, that Mark Redman left it all on the field, whether it was at work, it was at home, it was the, his family, his faith, whatever it was, he gave his all. So that's the way I try. I really do. I say a little pr prayer every day, you know, help me God to use this day well, not to grow complacent. Another saying I like is uh, some fellow ran a company for years and he said, why were you successful? And he said, I never stopped trying to qualify for the job. And I thought that is so key, you know, because once you achieve a level of a success in anything, it's easy to start to dial it back. And uh, I never want to do that, you know, and when I, I got to leave Spectrum at some point, Melinda, I hope that people say, you know, he, he kept trying to qualify for the job and he left it all on the field. So, and you held yeah. nothing, and you held nothing back because I know you, I know he held nothing back is in this book because I wrote it down, but you know, all those things really, in one little capsule, explain who you are as a human being. And I love the fact that during our interview, you never stop moving. And you are just one of these people that 
you're rolling around in that chair. Perpetual just, motion. It's like it's like it's like the the Mark Redmond dance. You're just you know you're, you're loving what you do and you're hugely successful. And thank um, you, thank and you. And you serve so many. And the stories in your book called by Mark Redmond. You can get it at Phoenix. Mm -hmm. um, you talk a lot about the people you've served and their stories and also the people mm -hmm. who helped you get where you are. So yes. for that, Mark Redmond, I salute you and I honor you and I love you. And I think you are an extraordinary human being. And to my viewers, thank you for tuning in. Go get Mark's book. It's so worth the read and it's a quick read and it's a beautiful read and the stories will inspire you and transform you. So Mark, I'm going to put us back on the two of us so we can be together here. Um, love it. So thank you, God. Okay, that was fantastic. You. I'm All practically right. crying over here. Oh, uh, now listen, and you stay, you stay on right now, okay? You don't go anywhere, okay? I and to will. my viewers, thank you. I will see you soon and have a beautiful day and a wonderful autumn.